Karen, you think that there are some pitfalls in, in assuming that women's way of knowing implies that they are more holistic or more contextual or more well, empathetic. I, yes, this is, this is part of the construction, isn't it, of gender, so that I don't... Mm -hmm. It's very hard to say, you know, what would... Uh, do I think it's a woman or not? I, I'm, mm. <laughs> I think it's an individual, and I, think, mm. I do think that there's some very obvious differences between the sexes. You know, men have penises, women have vaginas... Women can give birth to babies, and these make huge differences in terms of the way in which we react to each other, what's uh, important to us, and how uh, really the society needs to be organised if the women are going to have the authority that men have. Um, so I'm not sure whether, you know, if women are in positions of, say, of science, doing science, I'm almost more of an objectivist, I think, than... than uh, Simon, because I think that uh, if you just say something like, uh, well, what's true is what happens to dominate, which I take it to be Nietzsche's view, then oh, history seems to show that men dominate, so what men say must be true. <laughs> that doesn't seem... So for me, I think that... that I don't think Simon's in agreement there. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I, but I think that actually historically for women, the idea of objectivity, the idea that even if in virtually every society that we know, not perhaps every society, but in virtually every society we know the women have been treated as inferior, uh, that doesn't show that women really are inferior, uh, that you can actually not just take the evidence... Um, but see that fundamentally there just can't be this reason. You know, we are just two sexes of one species and the point of view of one sex must be just as good in some sense as the point of view of the other, other sex. You see that even though it doesn't actually seem to have been carried out in very many societies. And I, I actually think that, if you, that one ought almost to start from the top down and say, OK, if we want to have a society in which women have the same authority as men, that should be instituted in the political organisation, guaranteed equal representation for both sexes, and then we can start looking at the other institutions because it is really the, the, democracy, the, the government which is the fundamental political institution and... Uh, maybe we'll find, you know, that there is a difference. It really, it and maybe sense. there isn't. But we don't really know because we haven't done the experiment, as you said. <laughs> yeah. Did you, you want to pick up? I, d I just want to say, I, I, I by no means wanted to associate myself with the idea that might is right or that because men say it's true, it must be true. I, 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 no, 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 no. I mean, Nietzsche himself, actually, although he gets a bad rap these days, um, he thought one of the more remarkable things about human beings was the will to truth. Um, I mean, Nietzsche was probably the first philosopher to write in a seriously post-Darwinian atmosphere. And, um, you know, and yet he knew that we have um, ideals, principles, goals, especially ones connected with truth, which, as it were, stand out against and can, are capable of standing against pure pragmatism. But this it's is not always it's, of Nietzsche. It's, it's mean, not because, always... No, no, it's there. Because, it's, because it's, Nietzsche also says of Socrates and the Christians and those who believe in the truth of equality that these are feminine followers of the herd, the meek mm, and the miserable. Mm, and he is not mm, in favour mm, of any of those tendencies within our society which have, in fact, enabled women and the meek and those who are not capable of imposing their point of view by force... Mm to actually have a say and be looked after. So I don't agree with you that when... That, that, well, Foucault would say the will to truth in, mm. in, in Nietzsche is just the will to power. Yeah, I think that's wrong. And you think it's wrong, <laughs> but I think there's a lot <laughs> in Nietzsche that <laughs> actually... St well, of, co of course... On that <laughs> yeah, it's not really the will to power even. After all, it's the will to self-expression. I mean, that's... I mean, you know, Nietzsche disliked a victim culture, I think. He... He thought that people should pull up their socks and go out and do stuff. Can, can I just say that one... I, I think the most important thing about women in science, it was just very briefly touched upon, but then we kind of lost it, 
and that is which science are you going to fund, which mm -hmm. is going to get done. Absolutely. Now, I don't know what it's like in Australia or America, but I'll tell you about England, or Britain rather. In Britain, there are seven research councils. That's, those are the councils who are responsible for distributing government support for um, education and for research. Um, there are things like the Arts and Humanities Research Council, the uh, Social Science Research Council, and so on. There are seven of them. Their joint budget is equivalent to the research budget of the Ministry of Defense. Mm -hmm. Now, all they ever manage to do is produce bulletproof wheelbarrows and things. <laughs> um, and yet their funding is uh, as much as the funding of everything else that the country does culturally. Mm -hmm. If you added medical funding, it would look even worse. It would be sort of 10 to 1 to everything else that's human. Mm -hmm. And I think that's shocking. It's basically two fears. The Ministry of Defense is there because we're afraid of the other. We're afraid of invasion and stuff like that. Um, medicine's there because we're afraid of dying. Mm -hmm. um, how you live while you're living doesn't seem to matter to anybody. <laughs> well, I think we've established... <laughs> I think we've established that we're, we're not afraid of questioning and questions and we'd love your participation now. We've got a good solid little bit of time to um, get a discussion going. Uh, so please, there is a microphone right in the middle and we do ask that you use the microphones, I, I won't, it, just so we can all hear. And there's also a microphone up there and I can see you queuing up already. So thank you, please, sir. Thank you. Um, recently I heard a, a very senior federal government minister use the, and her portfolio involved the application of science, use the expression consensus science. Now, it may have just been a reflection of the dreadful nature of political decision making, but do you think there are inherent dangers in approaching science in such a way, or are there some virtues in it? Mm, meaty one. Mm. Who'd like to take that up? Consensus science. I'm not quite sure what the phrase is supposed to mean, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I if don't it's... Know what it Do you want to give it some context? Is there any con it is a very specific term. Yes. And movement. It's meaning it? that uh, uh, we, we arrive at scientific truth by general agreement, what everybody likes, well, by a vote, if you like, rather yeah. than by what might actually be true. And oh, that's that's a, been a, that there's been a, a push disaster. for... That's a disaster, that's absolute a, catastrophe. A total disaster. <laughs> well, it comes from a movement called the Consensus Conference Movement, which is about bringing people together to debate scientific issue, controversy and issues of risk and then come up with a sort of set of policy advisories around, say, nanotech or, or other such things, you know? Isn't oh. it very difficult? I mean, there's, that on the one hand, you know, you yourself would say, what is objective? It is what, in the long run, those people who, who seriously look at the evidence agree is the truth. And so, in some sense, science is based on a consensus. But there, it, that does need to be a consensus amongst those people who've done the hard work mm -hmm. and you can't, uh, you, know, mm -hmm. you can't just do something medical on the basis of a consensus amongst people who know nothing about mm -hmm. how the body works. Absolutely. So no, no. Mm -hmm. And of course, as far as creativity and imagination and progress in science goes, it often depends in, entirely on the maverick who's, you know, asks the yeah. question everybody else thinks is stupid or mm. pursues the avenue that mm. nobody else will follow and so on. But so, on the other hand, in the long run, you do have to get a consensus after in, that imagination. Yeah, yeah. That, yes, in fact, it does work. That, that the experimental that you can test and the experimental yeah. method shows that it works. Science is the ultimate Darwinian jungle. You know, <laughs> hypotheses are born into you know, nature read in tooth and claw and then the other scientists try and pull them apart and the ones that survive go forward as the truth. <laughs> it's a nice metaphor. Uh, do we have a question upstairs? Thanks. Yeah, hi. Um, uh, it strikes me that a lot of what we've been talking about today is that there, there are sort of two delineations. There's what we know and there's the process of actually knowing. Um, and I'd be interested in finding out whether the panellists thought there were any specific gaps in what we know and whether or not that's because primarily there are certain classes of people, in this case women specifically, that are not involved as much as they should be in the process, or whether it's more because the people that are involved in that process are um, not adequately reflecting on the process in the manner that we're talking about today. Mm. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Mm -hmm. Good 
questions. Yeah. Adelaide Festival yeah. of Ideas audience has asked excellent questions. <laughs> so who'd like to take that one up? Well, I would say we have huge gaps in our knowledge, and I think it has precisely to do with the process. Um, and one, I think, very good example is um, medical research, I assume here also, but in the United States, women suffer twice as much from adverse effects of medication because they have not, in fact, been part of clinical trials. Now, this is a simple process. This doesn't take rocket science or something. It's kind of like Research 101. If you're setting up um, a population for study, it should be representative. This is kind of like, you know, this is really like ba first base here. So um, I think we, and, and it took, I should say, that there was no self-correcting mechanism in science to correct that. Now, one of the promises of Enlightenment science is that lots of people have these hypotheses. They compete, as you were suggesting, and then the good ones win out. And this means that um, if you do an experiment, then the, the people in the next lab can repeat the experiment. They should get the same answer, but they correct you if you have something wrong. But in this case, there was no self-correcting mechanism in science. And in fact, um, the federal government asked our National Institutes of Health in 1986 to please include women, um, and that had no impact. So we, we actually passed a federal law in 1993 in order to get the science right. So it often takes a lot to fill these gaps, but it is a gap because we don't understand the mecha basic mechanism of drugs in female bodies. It's still the case that a lot of animal models in scientific research are male animal models, and, and quite explicitly because um, menstruation and, or the reproductive cycle or whatever was considered a bit of an experimental mess in terms of a variable. Well, it just makes it more expensive and it makes it more difficult, but I think if we can send people to the moon, we can certainly Absolutely. look at, at female animals. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> there, there are a lot of difficulty once... So uh, lab animals are raised for this purpose, and they just didn't, they don't have a supply of the female animals. I mean, it's as simple as that. You'd have to get people, people to make the female animals. And then most of the medical testing is not done on old animals mm. because, you know, they want to get the animals in, out, you pay for the animal, you kill the animal, you do the experiment, and they don't wait. No one is waiting for the animal to age. So I think age is another issue that we don't have good medical um, experiments for. Simon. Yes, uh, and I'm not sure how it plays out on the, the gender thing, but um, I once heard that 95% of results in psychology journals are produced by, um, from samples of the population, which consist exclusively of youngish people who live within five miles of a major research university. <laughs> <laughs> and well, well, even worse than that, Stanford is famous for its social psychology, and I was on a PhD yes, exam. They use their own students. Yes, it's not only so that, it's like your own students. This cannot possibly be representative. And I think it was discussed yesterday that many um, medications or psychotropic drugs medications were tested on prisoners for a long time, mm -hmm. um, not general populations. Well, so, and, and forcibly often. I mean, these weren't subjects by choice. Have we got another question? I think there was another one here. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you all for your um, stirring debate. Um, my name's Corey Baker and um, I'm here with a colleague of mine, Hilary Coleman. We both um, are doing our PhDs in inorganic chemistry at the Department of Chemistry at Adelaide here. And um, earlier this year, the first female academic in chemistry was appointed um, ever. And um, <laughs> <laughs> that might Let's be see, what surprising. year is it right now? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And, um, but she's, she's, I can see that she's going to be quite successful. And also um, Tanya Munro in the Department of Physics has been extremely successful. Um, if anyone familiar with her work, she's um, getting the most funding, I think, out of all of the um, professors in both the Department of Chemistry and Physics. Mm -hmm. And my question to you is, um, we're at an extremely important crossroads here where um, women now do have the opportunity and they do have the encouragement on the most part and they do have um, the accessibility to study and to become a professor and have an impact and be an academic. But there's still this problem where we've got over half the people in our undergraduate and um, 
undergraduate contingent in the chemistry department are women, over half, and there's still no one, only one person still has only been appointed as, as an academic. And this is because of all of my colleagues that are women, they cannot see a path as an academic and while they raise a family. There is no, there is, you cannot, you can pretty much can't do it. And I know from, from Tanya, that I've heard on the grapevine, the only reason that she's managing is because her partner takes on a, a role at home, much more with her children. And so my and question to you like is... four children, I think. Well, three or four children. That's she's right, she's got a few children, yep. Uh, mm. And I think the question is, we need to really be looking at the construct of society to change that and um, to get people... Because um, at the moment, you can't... You have to um, publish papers in advance and release them during your um, you know, nursing period as to not fall out of uh, academic... You know, uh, Position. And so if, if we can change society, my second question is, if we can change this, this construct and get more women into senior academic positions, um, what do you think the, the direction of research might take, given that there's been extremely influential and um, different and ways of looking at science, such as uh, Rachel Carson, who, when she released uh, Silent Spring, which had a great impact on the world and I guess took a good humanitarian look at science, and also Susan Greenfield in uh, London, who is establishing... The, has helped to establish the Royal Institute. It's soon to open here in Adelaide mm -hmm. and has taken on much of a communication role and has been a great model and, a, and an advocate for mm -hmm. women in science. Okay, good series of questions and thank you for that and thanks for sharing your own experience too. I, and it was interesting reflecting on Larry Summers' comments. Some of you might have heard he, mm -hmm. he, he was the president of Harvard until recently. Now he's a senior advisor in the Obama administration, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, he made the comment that... Uh, that um, one of the reasons he thinks that women don't succeed in science is because they can't do 80-hour weeks. Um, so, I mean, who wants to pick that up? Me. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, I don't think Larry Summers works 80 hours a week, although I have seen him nodding off in those Obama <laughs> meetings. Now, no one works 60, uh, 80 hours a week all the time, right? So Stanford professors work about 60 hours a week. That's a lot. Um, most professors across the U.S. work about 55 hours a week. Now, coming to this issue of home and, and work, ba the balancing act, you know, it goes way back to the 18th century, and it's really built into society, so you are absolutely right that we need social change. So um, there, there have been a lot of studies of how to do that. Well, first of all, let's look at the problem. So our Berkeley colleagues have a study out that shows if women have a baby five years after their PhD, women are 38% less likely to get tenure than the men, males who have babies. Because men, in fact, are rewarded for being family men, but women are not rewarded, um, and they don't have the backup to be family women. Um, I mean, it was always amazing to me when we had little children, my husband would bounce them on his knee in public, and this got accolades, right? <laughs> oh, look, he's bouncing the cute baby. And I mean, if I'm bouncing the baby, it's like, oh, is she not serious about her work? You know, this sort of thing. <laughs> so, number one, there is a Swedish study that shows that women have to publish 2.5 times more articles to get the same... Uh, numbers of grants and positions as men do. Now, that was specific to Sweden, but I think um, it, it happens a lot. But in Sweden, where there's a, a <laughs> yeah. comparatively good equity situation happening. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, let me tell you some of the things we're doing in the United States that are attempting to help women in this balancing act. Um, first of all, there's delaying the tenure clock, and that is... Um, you have this, as you were mentioning, you have this pressure point at the time that you're supposed to be publishing for tenure, but also it is the time that you are reproductive as a human being. And so the idea is that both the male and the female can stop their clock for a year to give them extra time um, for taking care of children and then also doing their academic work. Um, there are... You know, so American universities also support daycare so that you can at least outsource some of this work. And there are often daycare centers right on campus. This is very, very helpful because you can drop off the child or your partner can drop off the child and they're right there. It's easy access, that sort of thing. Now, people have focused a lot on 
the child and um, having children, but they haven't focused so much on the housework that academics do. My institute just did a study of dual career academic couples. So this is where both of the people in the relationship are professors. And we were talking about how hiring practices at universities need to change, and in fact are changing. But we also collected data on housework. And we find, we find that um, even in these academic couples where both people are on tenure track or tenured, that was, we studied only the top universities in the US and only permanent faculty. So you're getting a very rarefied group of people. We find that the women are doing twice as much housework than the men, even though they have the very same jobs. So our recommendation will be um, that universities actually in their benefits package offer a benefit for housework as well, offer a, a package of benefits so that you can use them in any way that you need to enhance your productivity. Our study showed that people who outsource their house cleaning, their core housework, actually are more productive. So I think that this is the way that we're going to have to go about. Maybe in Australia, your government will do this sort of thing, but in the United States, our institutions do these sorts of things. So I think you need these kinds of policies. We all need these kinds of policies to pick up the burden, the work that has been placed on women's shoulders mm. to take care of, to keep the home fires burning. I'm just wondering, could we answer that question in Australia? Would our government do that sort of thing? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, then they should. That couple more. I think we've got a couple, few more can minutes. I just, can I just say, oh, Karen, yeah. however, one of the things you said was that it's too hard to have children and have an academic career. I think that one shouldn't take that view. I mean, I, th I have children, mm -hmm. Lona has children, and you can have children and have an academic career. And in the end, you know, even if, okay, it's hard work, anything that's worthwhile is hard work. And uh, a child, you know, maybe it takes a year or two out of your career, but slows you down a bit. But we are very long-lived creatures. And uh, there's enough time to have an academic career and have children. <laughs> yeah. Simon. I'm sure there is, and uh, one institutional problem, I mean, uh, not to mention the tenure clock in the United States. I mean, <laughs> you've got to remember that after tenure, a lot of men go to sleep. <laughs> in fact, there's a, there's a wonderful metaphor for tenure. Some of you may know there's a fish, I forget its name. There's a little fish that... Um, its life cycle is it sets off, it goes buzzing about, and eventually it mates, and it's, if it's female, it gets eggs. And then it finds a hole, and it goes into this hole, and it, eat, it, it, it eats its own brain. That's, the, that's, its, that, that's, that's its source of protein. That's, its, that's its, its only source of protein, and it doesn't need eyes and things after that, because it's, it's just an egg-laying pouch. And, um, and it's known as the tenure fish. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so maybe there should be compulsory housework for all old it academics. <laughs> yeah, I think the older men should do the housework of the we younger women. should send them off to, to do the housework oh, for great. the younger women. Do we have any right. more questions? I think that I've understood correctly that everyone on the panel has agreed that science is socially, culturally, historically and temporally constructed and that the so-called scientific truths we've got access to are... Um, very much a matter of what questions we're prepared to ask and prepared to fund. And given that, I'm left with a dilemma of sources of legitimacy. And I wanted to ask each of you, where do you look for a source of legitimacy when you're trying to make a decision about something that you should do? And the reason why I'm asking this question is because I'm an engineer and I work in developing countries. And I've seen the most amazing technologies fail because they're not socially, culturally, or temporally appropriate. And I would actually even disagree with Simon's earlier statement that the, it's better to construct a bridge out of steel than cast iron because that depends on the particular community and the time and the place that you're in, and it might have been much better to build it out of bamboo. So... Um, yeah, would each of you mind telling me, where do you look for legitimacy given the contextual and contingent nature of everything? Could I, I have a go? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I, I plead guilty to the point about the bridge. You're quite right. 
touche. Um, I think there are two different kinds of legitimacy we, we might want to distinguish. One is the legit legitimacy of the science in the sense of the results. We've been using the example of the sun being 93 million miles away. And the source of legitimacy there was simply the epistemology, the amazing achievement of using things like parallax and very, very delicate optical measurements to get it right. Um, and if somebody says, well, why is that judgment legitimate? You just have to take them to what was necessary to make a, an estimate of the distance of the sun, and that's the source of legitimacy. legitimacy. When it comes to policy, of course, you've got a whole new ball game because policy will require judgments about welfare, about amelioration, about distribution of resources, about impact on the status quo. And there you've got a whole um, you know, slew of sometimes moral questions, questions of distribution, ethical questions, political questions. And their legitimacy is much, much harder to find because there's no established, agreed-upon method for answering those questions. People disagree about everything, including measures of welfare. You know, what's the good life? Is ours the good life or is a, a romantic savage the good life? So there you've got a, you know, a very different set of problems and legitimacy is very contested, and I think rightly contested. And eventually the decisions have to be in a sense, democratic decisions, but one hopes wise ones for all that, which goes back to the necessity of educating the, the democracy, educating the people who are making these decisions, which we've been talking about. Thank you to our panels. Um, just to, well, yes, let's give them a cheer. Simon Blackburn and Londo Sheebinger.